I'm gonna get to see. Alright. Good morning. I'm Mark Luthen, and I'm here at Nigrin Wetland Preserve, a little bit west of Rockton, Illinois. I'm here with Kim Johnson, marketing and membership director for Natural Land Institute, as well as Julie Tackett, who's a volunteer with Natural Land Institute from here on out called NLI. Um, she's a volunteer with NLI, also serves on our education committee. This is our very first Facebook Live event. If you joined us last week, it was a practice round. So hopefully we got some of the technology worked out, wearing a microphone, etc. today. To get to the prairie that we're looking at today, this is called the Ann Meyer Prairie Garden. Um, to get here, and that's what we're gonna focus on mostly today, you go west of Rockton, about a mile and a half. Um, there's a, a big entrance for Niagara and Wetland Preserve, but we ask that our guests go down to the observatory or the observation deck, which is just west of here. And then you're going to take the, as you're facing the observation deck, you're going to take the Diane Nora Nature Trail to the east. So you're going to follow the road. You take a left as you're facing that observation deck. You're going to follow the road, and as you can hear, we're right next to the road. This is Rockton Road here. And um, come up here, and then there's a, a little joiner path for the Ann Meyer. I think what we'll do is walk up into the prairie a little bit, get away from the traffic, and let you enjoy some of the sights that we've been seeing all morning. This is a fantastic place. I think you'll like it. And I'll try not to walk too fast, and I'll try to walk backwards a little bit. Let me know if I'm going to trip on something. So, <laughs> so anyhow, um, this is a beginning or towards the end of the Ann Meyer Prairie Garden. It's named after Ann Meyer, who was a huge volunteer at Nigrin. Um, by the way, Nigrin, this is our 20th year in existence. Um, started in 2000, um, purchased 721 acres. So we're just going to see a small section of Nigrin. Nigrin's a, an awesome place. Of course, there's a wetland. And next week, actually in about three weeks, we're going to talk about the wetland a little bit. We'll be at, at the observation deck and um, for another Facebook Live event, but lots and lots and lots of uh, wetland type birds, egrets and herons and cranes and things like that will come in and we'll talk about that a little bit. Um, Nigrin, 721 acres, has prairie and we're looking at some of it today. It has an upland prairie. If you look up the hill here and I'm looking south here, there's a prairie up and over the hill and it's big and it's awesome. We're not going to visit that today, unfortunately. I'll let you do that on your own time. You can see some trees up there. Those are oak trees. Also, to our west, there's another batch of oak trees that you would have to walk through to get here. That's an oak savanna. Lots and lots of work has been done here at Nigrin over the past 20 years. We have three people on our stewardship staff, and their focus is on restoration. This used to be a farm field. Now it's a prairie garden named after Ann Meyer, who, as I started to say, was a volunteer, um, helped us establish this garden by growing prairie plants from seed, growing them up in the greenhouse up there, and getting a core group of volunteers to plant plugs in this area. 20 years later, this is what we have. Um, beautiful native prairie plants. Um, there is there's still some restoration work going on out here. As we're walking through, you can see a lot of grape ivy that's starting to take over. I imagine they'll want to get rid of some of that. Um, there's some Queen Anne's lace, which is a white flower. Um, some people call it a wild carrot, but it can tend to take over. You see it along roadsides and stuff, and we don't really want it up here. So there will be some maintenance work burning periodically during the springtime especially um, helps control some of those invasive weeds and it helps um, helps the prairie plants by putting the nutrients into the ground it warms the soil, things like that as we go along so still walking backwards here's a a little plant that we found earlier today this is called it's a type of mountain mint and mints are unique i'm going to break off one stem here if I can, if my nails are tough enough. 
First of all, they're kind of tasty if you're having breath problems. But mints also have a square stem. So when you roll it, you can feel the edges. So all mints have a square stem. And they do attract pollinators as I'm standing here. There's a bee on top of that mint. We'll talk a little bit about pollinators today and how important they are. But this is a type of mountain mint. And it, it's quite a, um, oh, is that Culver's root? It is, I think. <laughs> um, oh, sorry about that, I was talking about mountain mint. <laughs> I'm a former teacher and my students know I get distracted quite easily, so um, bear with me on this. But anyhow, this is a type of mountain mint. Kind of tasty. Um, I try not to take off too much. I did want to demonstrate the, the square stem on that. One of the favorite uh, prairie plants that you'll see is a milkweed. This is a common milkweed. And I always like to check under the leaves for signs of monarch eggs. Monarchs only lay their eggs on milkweed. The larva the caterpillars eat the leaves and then um, hopefully form a chrysalis and fly off as an adult. Um, if, if Kim is handy with the, the camera, maybe she'll catch a monarch and we've seen quite a few out here. Um, Culver's root, first time I've seen a blooming yet this year. Um, and it, Kim can't zoom in unfortunately with the camera, but you can see it there. Um, Culver's root is a bee magnet. Bees love it and um, it's really a good one to have hanging out. So let's walk a little bit more. We can walk slowly, talk a little bit. Um, here's that Queen Anne's lace again, more mountain mint. Um, one thing I like to do, you know, some people like to hike through a prairie. I tend to like to stroll. Go a little bit slower and then you pause by Maybe a cluster of this one. This is called bergamot, also monarda is a genus name. Some people call it bee balm. And as you watch carefully, if you just stand here and look, all of a sudden you'll see all this activity around there. Little tiny bees that you can barely see, all the way up to the big lumbering bumblebees um, that people easily recognize. But this is bee balm or monarda. Um, this one's almost done blooming. It's been blooming for several weeks already, which is a neat thing about the prairie. You come out here last week and we saw different things. We didn't see the Culver's root last week. The mountain mint really wasn't blooming too much. Uh, Monardo was in full bloom, but now it's shifting out and other things are, there's a monarch going over to the spider ward it looks like. I think that spider wart, it's, yep. yeah, it is. The seed had a spider wart. Several weeks ago, the spider wart was blooming. Right up close to where Kim is, is called gray-headed coneflower. And that one's almost done blooming as well. But you can see maybe off in the distance, some more with the petals drooping down. But those, you'll see lots and lots and lots of bees on those as well. Um, so we have the bergamot, the coneflowers, the milkweeds all attracting the bees at Culver's fruit. Um, there's sunflowers out here. I don't know if we'll get to see some today. But you start coming out in April and you come out once a week and you'll see these magnificent changes taking place out here. Um, about lost my microphone. Um, see these magnificent changes taking place every single week. Just different colors coming through and different um, and different um, bee activity and dragonfly and butterfly activity. Now this milkweed plant has been consumed by those little guys. I don't know exactly what those are, but obviously they seem to like the milkweed. Almost like a tent caterpillar, but without the tent. So I've never seen a swarm like that on milkweed. So not quite sure what that is. Maybe the birds or something will eat them, we'll see. The bird life out here is also fascinating. Next week, we'll be out here um, with another live program through NLI, and we'll have a person that monitors the bluebird houses. She'll be out explaining what they do and what they see as a, the summer progresses in our bluebird boxes. Maybe if we're lucky, we'll see a bluebird hovering around looking for larvae to eat. Maybe I should go pick up some of those larvae. I don't know for sure. Um, I saw those are milkweed pussy moths. 
Okay, those are called milkweed tussock moths. Uh, Julie looking up information because she needs to make sure I don't make anything up and tell you guys falsehoods. So thank you, Julie. Milkweed tussock moth. Okay, so there's a milkweed in full bloom. I'm trying to think of, we saw a few plants that we wanted to show you. Oh, here's an interesting one. You'll notice there's a lot of color out here, and those are what we call forbs, um, the flowering plants that we call forbs. There's also some grasses mixed in. Now, I, this prairie garden is a little bit forb heavy, but there are some grasses mixed in. I think it's forb heavy just because we wanted to have our guests see the wide variety of um, different plants out here. I think initially there were 48 different um, species of plants out here. And honestly, I don't know all the names and, and it doesn't matter what all the names are. But there are some grasses and this one's just starting to come into bloom. This is called um, Side Oats Grandma and you can see the little red flower there. I don't know if you can see that with the camera, but little red flower and that's Side Oats Grandma couple weeks or a month or two, um, I'm sure they'll be out here collecting the seed from that. Here's another one that's done blooming. This is called thimbleweed. Looks like a thimble, I guess. Several thimbleweeds in here that we hadn't seen, so that's kind of cool. Um, we did see some purple prairie clover earlier. Oh, it's back here. Oh, there's some nice liatris last week the purple here was not blooming so again you come out in a week and things change you come out next week some of the cone flowers might be done but other things might be coming in the fall you'll see asters you'll see goldenrods blooming like crazy so kim's focusing in on a, a prairie blazing star liatris species and there's four or five different liatris species that we might find out here. Again, that's a bee magnet. The bees love that. Now a lot of you are thinking, well, I want flowers at home, but I don't want bees. But the bees are beneficial, not only to the flowers, but they're beneficial to all our crops and things like that. Uh, a lot of you have probably heard that the honey bee is having issues. Well, the honey bee is actually um, a European bee and it does have some issues with mites and and hives um, you know you get a complete failure of a hive and things like that but a lot of the native bees are also struggling and the native bees um, are struggling due to pesticide use so using pesticides on your yard I know some of you have probably a Japanese beetle inundation I know I do my neighbor asked me yesterday she goes well don't you spray anything on those beetles I go no because I don't want to affect my bees. And if you look, there's all this life. I have a little prairie plot at home. There's all this life. And, and if you just sit there looking, lots and lots of things going on. And it's, it's just fun to just sit there and watch. So I don't want to harm my bees by putting pesticides on our plants. And I pluck off the Japanese beetles and maybe say a curse word or two, but probably not. And kind of go through there. Um, so, liatris, it's a bee magnet. We want to keep our bees around. Some people think that they might be the most important insect on earth. So keep the bees. Anyhow, when the bees are feeding, they don't bug you. Unless you go up and try and grab it or something. You can get inches away from a bee while it's feeding. It doesn't care. It's just trying to collect the pollen for its hive. Now, if you disturbed its hive, that's a different story. So try not to do that. We have a couple plants here that I haven't mentioned yet. This is a pretty common one in a prairie. It's called Black-Eyed Susan. It's a, a lot of people use that um, as an ornamental at their house, and, and it's a good one to have. It was probably a lot thicker in here when this little prairie garden was established, but as other plants start taking hold, and it might take three or four or five years before you start seeing a, a huge amount of diversity. So we're 19 years into it. I think they started this in 2001. We're 19 years into it, so we see this tremendous diversity. And here's another unique one, and, and I think we have a better specimen over here somewhere. Um, this is called Rattlesnake Master. The myth, it got its name um, that they thought the rattlesnake venom could be cured by using this plant. And I say that's a myth because 
it's not true. But that was the early pioneers thought that. Um, and if you look at the leaves, you might recognize this if you go out to the desert southwest. It's actually in the yucca family, if I'm not mistaken. So it, it tends to like the drier soils, more well-drained soils. I have clay soil at home and spider or um, rattlesnake master doesn't seem to do so well um, in my soils at home. But out here it's doing great. Doing okay. So again, what I would suggest you do is instead of hike through a prairie, take a stroll. Let the life come to you. If you sit long enough, you're gonna just see this overwhelming abundance of life. Um, as we've been out here, dragonflies have been buzzing us. Um, it's kind of cool. Damselflies. Now, damselflies and dragonflies are a little different. Um, the dragonflies, when they land, their wings are outstretched like this, and they're typically a little bit bulkier, a little bit heavier. The damselfly, they fold their wings up on their back, and they're pretty narrow. Oftentimes in this area, they're like a bluish color, um, but they're both good because they eat insects that are buzzing around. Oh. They eat insects that are buzzing around, and, um, and that's good. Insects like mosquitoes. Now, Kim was focusing on the Bluebird House, as I mentioned, next Wednesday, same time, same location, um, we'll be talking about the Blue, Bluebird monitoring experience. Now, here's another also butterflies like that. That's called vervain, hoary vervain. Um, it's a good plant to have. Um, I just like it because it, it flowers for a long time. You can see a little worm on there. So if you look closely, you can see some insects just, you know, if you're walking at a brisk pace, you might miss some of that stuff. But if you take, take your time and look at the plants a little bit, we're doing good. I should mention that um, while Julie monitors this, um, she is monitoring this Facebook Live event. If you happen to be watching and give us a like so we kind of know how many people are watching live, that'd be great. And she will be around to uh, field questions at the end. So if you have a question, uh, feel free when we kind of wrap this up in a few minutes. Um, if you have a question, type it in and we'll try and answer it and, and get you something right away. So. Hey Mark, can we walk over to the birdhouse and look at the, I think it's wild piano? Mm, oh, okay. So we're going cross country here. We're being brave. Don't know what's out here. So here's some more grasses coming in. Um, you come out in the fall and oftentimes, you know, the big blue stem is in full, full bloom and full color. And it's a nice one and we just, no, we didn't. Um, it's a nice one in the fall, you get some nice color. Oh, that is Senna. That's another bumblebee magnet. Um, they love that plant and it's it's quite pretty so so that's senna s-e-n-n-a there's some thistle out here now some thistles are non-native and they work to eradicate them especially the canada thistle it, it tends to be quite invasive and um, that one might be a native because it's white on the bottom whoops So one plant we didn't see out here was um, prairie sinkafoil. I know we've seen it out here before. That's a nice one that's in full bloom. Um, oh, here's another one that we hadn't looked at yet. This one, and you can see some bees buzzing around. This is another type of monarda. Remember the bergamot is a monarda. This is another monarda, and there's lots of life going on in there. This is called um, spotted horse mint. I'm not sure why it's called that, the horse mint. I don't know if horses like it or if it tastes like a horse. <laughs> Who knows? But anyhow, look at the pollen on this beer. I, I don't know if I can focus in on that. Look at the pollen that's lugging around. 
I think TSA would charge it extra for those bags of pollen. So anyhow, that's um, spotted horse mint. There's another type of horse mint that's done blooming. It's actually not a monarda, but again, the monarda, this horse mint, they do have square stems. So they're in the mint family or related to mints. Um, but these love the bees and look at that black one there. Yeah, yeah. I don't know bees very well. There's a little brown dragonfly right behind it. Do you see it with kind of clear wings? So if you just stand here and let the life come to you, it's, it's just kind of cool, you know? It's okay to get out and hike and, and get that cardio in, but it's also okay to take a little stroll. And that's what I prefer doing, so. So black-eyed Susan, very nice, the Monarda blooming. Yep, there's another dragonfly that we kind of scared up. It has, it's a darker one um, with little spots on its wings. I'm not a big dragonfly, dragonfly identifier, and it doesn't matter. You know, you might not know any names of wildflowers, but if you get out and hike, if you want to learn the names, great. If not, enjoy the colors, enjoy the activity that's going on around us. Mark, mention that we do have, uh, we do have wildlife monitors that monitor dragonflies and damselflies in our preserves. So okay. Okay, um, if you want to learn about wildlife, we do have wildlife monitors out here at Nigran. They monitor the dragonflies and damselflies, uh, possibly bees. They, um, I know there's a rusty patch bumblebee that's been out here. Rusty patch is unique in this area because it's, it's pretty prevalent in this area, um, northern Winnebago County and Boone County, but it's threatened or endangered across the United States. So it's kind of kind of cool that we have the rusty patch out here. Um, you don't go up and grab a bee to identify it, but you try and get close enough that you can maybe take a picture and there's lots of ways to identify, but we do have groups that monitor that type of life out here. We have a Okay, someone's watching, thank you. <laughs> so, so we're done? Oh, okay, okay. Um, we had someone that was um, out here for the very first time a couple weeks ago, and they said it's a great place, and I, I happen to agree. And you, the big trail, the first trail I mentioned, is actually a two and a half mile trail if you wanna see quite a few of the sites of Niagara. And um, this is a much smaller loop. It actually ends up at the barn up there. And again, we ask you not to park up there. That's where our, our stewardship staff parks and, and we do have some volunteers out here today. Um, if you wanna get involved with NLI, there's several different ways. We rely on volunteers. Many thousands of hours every year are put in by volunteers, not only out here, but in our 27 different preserves. Uh, five, six mainly. Okay, um, but we own we own 26 preserves. We have over 2,700 acres of land. I should have mentioned that earlier when I had my notes. But so NLI, that's our business. Getting land, protect, protecting it, restoring it um, for wildlife and restoring it for us because humans need this, in my opinion. Um, we have 49 conservation easements and that protects another what 3,000 plus acres um, so conservation easements if you want to learn about that if you have some land and you want it preserved in a state like this contact NLI and we'll set you up but our volunteers are so important out here because they help with the prairie burns they help with pulling weeds or things like that they help with clearing um, over here there's they cleared out the savanna area that was just full of things like honeysuckle and buckthorn they cleared that out they're going to put in some savanna species that are probably more native in this area so we rely on volunteers for that because our stewardship staff of three can't do everything okay so if you want to get involved and when I go out with the stewardship staff to volunteer, I learn something. 
every single time. I learn the name of a plant, I learn name of a bug, I learn how certain things relate to each other, I learn about hemiparasites. I hadn't heard about those ever in my life, um, which is you know kind of cool stuff. So you're gonna learn something. It doesn't matter if you know the names of the plants, you just get out and enjoy. So I think we're about ready to wrap things up. I probably talked too long. Um, I know my students always said I did. But if you have some questions, Julie will field those, and then um, we'll sign off if, if we answer any of the questions. So Again, next week we'll be looking at the bluebird houses, so type those questions in if you have them. Next week, same time, bluebird houses. August 12th, same time, we'll be at the observation deck, which is the main entrance for NLI for our guests, or for Niagara and for our guests. And we'll look at the observation deck and talk about some of the birds that are out there. Um, we heard cranes earlier this morning, which was kind of cool. If you come out here in the fall, never seen a crane before, this is a place to come. Sandhill cranes, the occasional whooping crane, but for sure sandhill cranes. And they're going to be so loud that you can't even hear yourself talk. So, which is fun. Any questions? Okay. Well, thank you for watching. Hope to see you again. Um, anyhow, it's been fun. Thank you, Julie. Thank you, Kim. And we're done.